Awesome. Okay. Um, I I, th uh, I guess I didn't mention uh, my name is Jake, and I'm a second year master student in the Energy Graduate Group, and I currently work on electric vehicle grid integration, um, but broadly interested in decarbonization and uh, decarbonization policy. And so um, uh, I ran across Dave Weisskopf mostly through Twitter uh, originally, and uh, I would encourage everyone to follow him on Twitter. He's got some good, good analysis. And the reason I uh, was excited to reach out to him um, was because I think he did a really good job of, of both kind of framing the severity of the climate crisis and kind of not um, being honest about that and not, not being afraid to take a stand against uh, incumbent industries when, it, when necessary, including fossil fuel industries, but at the same time, so he, he kind of seemed like really activist oriented, but then at the same time, he had a really, uh, he has a really good in-depth understanding of policy nuances and levers of uh, political power in the state. And so um, I'm ex excited to be able to uh, have him share his thoughts on the corona, the new reality and sort of the thinking about climate action and climate policy, given this sort of unprecedented situation we're all in and the state is in. Um, I think it's really easy to not think about climate in this moment because we're faced with uh, Acute economic, uh, acute economic pain, and also acute public health um, concerns. And I think it's sort of, on the one hand, that's it's necessary to address this crisis fully. But then, on the other hand, climate is sort of the only one, the only crisis that's even more existential and even more um, looming in a way. And so, it's not going anywhere. And I do think it's important to continue. Uh, thinking about climate action, climate policy, as much as possible. Um, so without further ado, let's give a, uh, a warm finger snap welcome to our speaker, Dave Weisskopf. Um, and Dave, let me know if uh, the screen share doesn't work or anything, if you Wait, end up wanting um... Yeah, I hate slides, so I don't intend to share my screen, uh, although I may at certain points hold up my notebook um, for illegible notes. Um, thanks everyone for coming, and thank you Jake and everyone else um, from the club for putting this series together and for everyone who logged in. Um, it was helpful to have the overview of who is on the, um, on the conference call because by my count, we have people from undergrad, MS, PhD, law, um, at work now in city government and nonprofit and retired, uh, and fields ranging from uh, ag and conservation through mechanical engineering um, and everything in between. So, um, sort of of necessity for a group this diverse in terms of where you're at, in terms of uh, um, specific knowledge base and um, in your careers and in your studies. Um, I'm going to probably talk about something that nobody knows anything about, um, including me. Um, and that is the, um, the political process, the sausage making of sort of where policy comes from um, that Jake alluded to that I sort of ill-advisedly tweet more openly than a person probably should about. Um, so the sort of one sentence blurb that I gave on, on this talk was something like uh, um, dealing with the climate crisis, the um, global pandemic and the massive recession that is now underway uh, all at the same time while working from home. Um, this sort of big story of climate advocacy of 2019 and 2020 has been kind of the emergence of a lot of um, a lot of sort of mass protest um, 
people-driven energy around taking climate action. Um, the growth in research and technology um, and interest in, in kind of new ways of providing energy services uh, is something that's sort of been going on for a while uh, and it's been developing and certainly it's helped along by the amount of kind of mass political energy that's in the air. But the there's been a clear kind of um, breakthrough in public consciousness around climate really in the last maybe two years. Um, I don't know if you are aware of the podcast um, Hot Take that um, Amy Westerveld and Mary Hagler do, but they, in their first maybe three episodes of that podcast, just kind of went through the reporting about climate change that existed, you know, in 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20. And um, there were these kind of clear lines of demarcation where after a certain point in 2018, uh, they stopped having to hunt for stories and started having to filter out a lot of stories. Um, so right in the midst of that change, um, with a lot of energy around um, concepts like the Green New Deal, um, a lot of talk about climate in the context of the presidential election, where multiple candidates were running on the strength of their climate policy. And where um, even the sort of least fleshed out climate plans among the presidential candidates is sort of miles ahead of what anyone has put forward previously. Um, right in the midst of that, literally right in the midst of the presidential primary, uh, we had Super Tuesday on March 3rd. Uh, we had City of San Francisco go into shelter in place, I wanna say March 13th. Uh, we just had a primary in Wisconsin during the lockdown. Um, and everything has been really very, like very literally um, sort of blown apart. Uh, we had this, we had this moment where uh, it seemed like the big driver of change in the climate world was that lots and lots of people were coming together. Um, people were in the midst of planning for, um, you know, probably the biggest public demonstrations around climate uh, ever uh, on Earth Day. Uh, April 22nd, it was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and um, folks globally, including Greta Thunberg and, and um, pretty much everyone else was planning, you know, in the city of Sacramento, will we get 10,000 people out in San Francisco? Will we get 100,000 people out and so on? Um, and all those plans had to get put on hold. So that disruption um, in the public energy around climate action uh, has left a lot of us not so much um, how do I say it? It's not my job to be a um, to be an organizer. Uh, I work with some great organizers, uh, and it's their job. Um, it's and it's not most of the people that I work with every day. It's not their job either. I mostly work with legislators, regulators, um, expert staff at NGOs, um, people in government. But all of us are in kind of a very similar position around what's going on in the legislature and in the governor's office and every place else in the state. Um, in a way, we're seeing a disruption now that's very similar to the disruption we saw in November 2016 when Trump was elected. Um, at that time, the focus of the environmental movement was on the federal government, uh, and we were making very sort of measurable progress towards um, a couple of key federal benchmarks. The Clean Power Plan had been finalized, which was the first ever regulation on carbon emissions from power plants. Um, the Obama administration was working on a plan essentially to wind down the federal coal leasing program. 
uh, big reforms were happening to how uh, royalties for fossil fuel extraction on public lands were managed, uh, what's required of companies if they are entering bankruptcy and have um, obligations to their workers and to clean up environmental remediation. And there were sort of all of these important but incremental things going on at the federal level. And then the next question was, of course, how could the presumptive Clinton administration be pushed to take all of those things up to the next level? Um, of course, what happened instead is that I and everybody else had to very quickly get used to um, not just putting the brakes on, but an active you know, campaign of reversal of, uh, of all of those things and everything else good in the world. Um, my role as uh, a person who works for NextGen, which is an organization that is um, unabashedly very progressive, uh, very much focused on pushing policymakers to um, take the steps that are required by science and general humanitarian principles. Um, and uh, our affiliation with Tom Steyer, who was, I think, the you know the largest individual Democratic political donor who um, led a campaign to impeach Donald Trump, um, really left at least me as an advocate who works kind of narrowly on specific climate policies in a position where uh, I was not the person that you would send into a room to negotiate with Andrew Wheeler or Scott Pruitt. Um, because we essentially just don't have anything to talk about. Um, it's clear to them that my position is the opposite of theirs. It's clear to me that their position is the opposite of mine. Um, not everyone is in that position. Some folks uh, at other NGOs like the World Resources Institute or EDF or um, the Nature Conservancy are in a position where they have a essentially non-political um, uh, way of approaching problems. Um, that to me seems to have not been um, made much difference at the federal level, uh, but they at least have a conversation to have. They have, you know, positions to advocate for. They have people in Congress um, and the Senate to talk to. Um, but really, for the rest of us, uh, either you are a litigation-oriented NGO, like, say, the Sierra Club or NRDC or Earth Justice, um, who have big practices in litigation, who are um, working night and day to defend essentially every federal environmental protection. Um, and the same for immigration rights communities and, and uh you know, every other issue. Um, so either you are suing the federal government over um, illegal actions to roll back rules in a manner that they're not actually permitted to do, or you are an outside organizer who is um, marching, protesting, otherwise disrupting the activities of the federal government, and there is not a lot of room for anything in between. And a lot of us fall in that in-between space where really what our job is to do is to push policymakers based on um, really solid information and based on having a strong connection to the public outside of what people tend to hear in the halls of power. What I and a lot of us did uh, was shift our focus to state government. Uh, is still possible to, for example, um, enact big changes to electricity uh, systems. So during that time, California in 20, I don't know if it was 2016 or 17, enacted a 50% RPS. Um, in 2019, we enacted a 100% clean energy standard. Uh, I believe at this point, seven, maybe eight states, uh, I forget if Virginia is number seven or eight, have enacted 100% clean energy standards. Uh, at the time that I um, started working on clean energy related issues in 2013-14, um, people didn't actually like to mention 100% as a topic. Um, it was sort of taboo in the, in the environmental NGO community. 
Um, so in the course of you know three or four years, that went from being something that you don't mention to something that is the law of the land in um, something like a fifth or a sixth of America by population. So that focus, um, that focus shift from federal government to state government meant um, that there was a, a lot of learning to do and there was a lot of big changes. Uh, and we're essentially at that point again right now where we didn't know what to do with the federal government um, and then a crisis emerged, or excuse me, in the wake of a crisis. And now we're in the same position again where a crisis has emerged that affects both the federal government and every state government. Okay, very long-winded backdrop. Um, I have like probably, you know, half an hour more stuff to go through, but I actually want to stop here and maybe invite a few questions and discussion before we go into talking a little bit about the specifics of California climate policy. So Jake, I don't know how you handle so, this. Do you want to just let people jump in or put their name in a queue or raise hand or how do you want to do that? Uh, let's do, if you have a question, um, let's just let's just try it out. Um, try out just starting talking. If it doesn't work, then we can go to a chat-based system. Okay. Yeah, so actually I have a kind of a, a question just to, I don't know, because I, I don't necessarily understand like fully how the process works. But in terms of like state legislation, how does, um, how does the process like work with with trying to get like individual counties to move along with state things because I come from Kern County and uh, <laughs> Bakersfield's a very conservative place, you know, and, and a lot of the economy is driven by oil. Um, like how do you get, you know, like kind of the diversity of, of California's political actors to sort of work uh, towards, towards climate, uh, pro-climate positions, I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, so this is, I think uh, one of, if maybe not the most important question, uh, it's the same question that you have at the national level about moving different states along, um, moving different constituencies, um, sort of interstate constituency groups. Um, uh, Jake, I am assuming slash hoping that you're going to get Leah to give one of these talks. Um, her book is really invaluable. Leah Stokes has written a really, really valuable book, um, essentially on this topic. And what she does there is uh, she lays out a theory of political process that um, I think better than most processes takes account of the way laws kind of actually get written. And there are a bunch of factors there that she can present much better than I can. But um, I want to sort of present two kind of competing theories of political action that um, that I think we have enough experience now to say, you know, it was a kind of a, a hypothetical question and now I think we can kind of empirically answer it. One theory of political action, um, especially specifically around climate, is the one um, espoused by in one version or another. Um, by a lot of clean energy industries, by the citizens climate lobby, um, by a lot of conservation groups. Uh, and that is that there are certain things that everybody values. Uh, we all value health, we all like going outdoors. Um, no one particularly loves wasting money. Uh, um, people fall at different points on the spectrum on that. And if you can appeal to those sort of common values, uh, it will be possible to get broad-based support from people across the political spectrum for policies that would be characterized as sort of common sense. Um, the other theory of political action, uh, and the one that I personally adhere to, and is kind of the founding theory of NextGen, um, and is sort of the basis for, uh, for Tom Steyer's activism, is that this is a fight, we win it by winning. 
um, most arguments that are presented are in bad faith. And that essentially we have a profit motiv motivated industry on one side, we have um, um, people who are trying to protect all life on earth on the other. And neither side uh, is prepared to give up. Neither side really has a lot of room to compromise because both are in a fight for their life. Um, I think that my theory that this is a fight is correct. Um, I think that you probably don't need more evidence for that than observing the process that's played out in Oregon over the last couple of years, where advocates worked very, very hard um, to develop a consensus-based, really very modest um, cap and invest climate policy. They experimented with a lot of different designs, and we saw the same thing in Washington, ranging from modest carbon taxes, incentives, opt out for special industries. Um, certain regions effectively don't have to participate in the process was watered down and watered down and watered down until really enacting the bill um, was almost just symbolic of the state saying it's the policy of the state that we care enough about climate change to at least do a little something. That line um, was enough for um, politically motivated actors in the Oregon State Legislature to walk out, to flee the state, um, to shut down the legislature and deny the ability to seat a quorum so they couldn't vote on just essential core items of government on this topic or any other. Um, Governor Kate Brown in Oregon was within her rights constitutionally to send state marshals to actually um, arrests representatives who refused to show up for work. Um, when that topic was breached, um, multiple members of the Republican caucus um, made some pretty inflammatory statements. One essentially, um, uh, you know, walked right up to the edge of threatening to shoot anybody who came and tried to arrest him. Um, uh, um, members of extremist white supremacist groups sort of, you know, offered protection to these governor or to these um, representatives in hiding. Uh, and there's very little disavowal or attempt to disavow that, that association. So the idea that a consensus-based policy is possible that will bring along constituencies currently opposed um, has been tried a lot and for a long time. Arguably, the essentially the entire Obama administration was an experiment in that that failed. Um, to the point that all that he was able to do was enact uh, rules through his agencies and not do anything legislatively. Um, so the question then of how do you get reluctant counties to come along or reluctant constituencies, um, you win first. And that's not always possible, but ultimately it's the only thing that works. Because what does happen is that um, dynamics start to change after you win. And we see this in California's clean energy systems. Um, Kern County, which is uh, along with LA County, um, but especially Kern County, um, the seat of oil production in California, is also the place in California where uh, the largest number of solar installations are built. Now, that solar pol policy was enacted um, in stages and over time. Uh, and the investments that came to Kern County uh, came there essentially despite uh, Republican opposition from time immemorial, certainly from the 70s on. Um, but now that that solar is built there and people are working in that industry, there is a constituency there that supports it. So having lost that battle, now that geography, um, while it will fight to the death in defense of oil, is not particularly bothered by uh, clean electricity. They like installing solar there. 
Um, we see that same thing with different interest groups. If you are a labor union whose job it is to install and maintain natural gas pipelines, your position on building electrification is very different from if you are a labor group whose job it is to install and maintain electricity lines. Um, it's not a super pleasant answer. I wish that there were a nicer one. Um, but I think that that I think that that is the answer. It's not that you you know you don't convince Kern County to do the right thing on climate. You win at the state level by building up enough power in other places so that Kern County ends up um, against its will, essentially discovering the benefits of this transition. Uh, and then once those benefits materialize, the opposition starts to disappear. Okay, any other questions before we talk a little bit about sort of where, um, I think ultimately it's a question of how your stuff that you care about from all the fields that you're studying actually translates into policy. I have a question. <clears throat> yeah, I see two, I see Thomas and Brittany and maybe there's one or two others. Um, so my question is, uh, what inherent skills make people like you well suited for your jobs? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, that's not true. Okay. Uh, I don't think any skills for the most part are inherent. I think if you want to do something, you can learn how to do it. Um, there are things that I, that I gravitate towards that not everyone, um, in every part of the, you know, the ecosystem of climate action gravitates towards. So I should maybe give a little bit of background about myself. Um, I am one of a very small handful of people in my family who's gone to college. I went to a um, sort of college prep school in St. Louis and for high school um, on work study. Um, and the sort of expectation when you're there is that you are, you know, you take the SAT on this day, you start your college applications on this day, and it's all just kind of built in. Um, I didn't really have any, you know, models for what that meant, but people told me that, you know, that I was smart and that I would be going to college, and then I did. Um, I didn't know what to study, so I went to a college where I studied liberal arts in general, um, St. John's College in New Mexico. Um, same dynamic played out there. Um, I got to the end of that sort of period and uh, didn't know what to do next. So a teacher that I liked said, I know this guy who teaches philosophy in DC, you'd probably enjoy studying with him. So that's what I did. Um, it was only after spending maybe six years of not working on my dissertation, uh, despite having an approved topic in a committee that I started to suspect that I should actually take an active role in like how my life played out instead of just doing the next thing. Um, by that time, it was maybe 2007 or eight. Um, and um, what became the most important thing to me professionally was to work on climate change. So I dropped out of philosophy school. In 2007 and 8, if you wanted to work on climate change, you had three options. Um, one was you could work for free, which I couldn't afford to do at age like 28 or whatever it was. Um, and although in retrospect, that would have been the cheapest option. Um, two, you could be a climate scientist, uh, which I did not have the background or the desire to start from that far back in my career again. Or three, you could be a lawyer. Um, so I went to law school. Um, I was uh, uh, fortunate to be able to attend Stanford where I um, studied in their joint degree program in law and energy systems through the program called IPER that they have there. Um, I think they changed the name of IPER to something else. Maybe they didn't. Uh, but it's a joint degree program where you like law school students and business school students and really any department is a to take classes in um, School of Environmental Engineering Studies, or no, that's the thing, the department's name changed, and I don't know what it is now. 
Um, okay, so that's oh through the course of that process, the skills that I acquired were a systems view on problems, um, the ability to talk and to write, um, the ability to read things that are written very poorly, like philosophy texts and law um, opinions. Um, and I was able to learn enough about energy systems to, um, to think about the application of policy to technology. Um, so for example, um, I took a class on building energy systems um, where kind of the overriding theme of the class was by designing buildings for efficiency, um, they don't really cost any more on the front end. They save people money to live in. Uh, they're nicer to live in. They're more comfortable and nobody's doing it. So in that situation where there's, you know, this economic puzzle, why is nobody picking up the $20 bill or whatever? The answer is always because of policy. There's always some driver that is absent that is needed or there's some impediment that is present that needs to be removed. Um, and it is only really because of the interdisciplinary perspective of um, thinking simultaneously about the law and the energy system uh, that, that I was able to kind of grasp that at a stage when I think now that is almost a sort of commonplace insight um, in the climate community. Uh, that was a pretty new insight in you know 2010. Um, so one of the things there is that um, so for my particular skills that enable me to work kind of at the intersection of multiple issues and on policy making is the ability to um, think across fields and to identify um, that the solution to a problem in field A might actually lie in field B rather than in field A. You know, there are a lot of things that I'm not capable of doing as a result that I, you know, could have trained to do in the same in the same time period. For example, I could have, um, uh, and I think there was somebody on the call who's in law school who says they intend to um, represent um, energy companies uh, or state governments potentially through the public utilities commissions. Um, my same education and training um, could have led me down that road. And the fact that I, rather than being, say, a lawyer for the Sierra Club who works to um, intervene in dockets at the Public Utilities Commission to really focus on that venue and the kind of um, uh, deployment scale change that that involves, that means, you know, you're shutting down a power plant, you are getting money from a utility to certain efficiency or clean energy programs, and you're really enacting the granular scale change at that level. Um, I was inclined more towards the systems wide think approach, and that's what led me to look at, you know, essentially whatever the biggest umbrella policy level I could think of. So federal was where I started, and then I moved to state a few years later. Thank you. And um, someone, Brittany, I think you you had your hand up before, right? Um, I just wanted to ask a question. You mentioned something about a fight theory, and I just wanted you to go into further depth about that. As the Canadian, I'm a little unaware about what's going on down in the States, so that'd be a little nice to have a better insight. Well, it's, um, um, A lot of questions are a close call. So the California legislature is um, two thirds Democrat, which um, I think a lot of folks take to mean that we can enact whatever policy um, we want, no matter how progressive. Um, it's not really true though. 
because um, there's a lot that we are able to do that is not that is not sort of on the table in other states. But every difficult thing, every every everything that's not currently being done has to be fought for. Um, because there's some reason why it's not being done. And usually it's because there's somebody who's making money off of the fact that it's not being done. So if you think about the structure of, let's just say an oil company and how policy affects them. If I, um, if I own an oil company, I make money by selling oil. Uh, I actually don't, but let's leave that aside for a second. Um, if I'm not able to sell a lot of oil, then I can't justify um, all of the money. Um, so someone from another side, someone from say an, an environmental group um, says that we should enact a policy that um, will make cars run on less gasoline, right? If I can go, 100 miles a gallon instead of 30 miles a gallon. Technologically, um, I think you know many people on this call know how to make that work. Um, every car company knows how to make that work at this point. Um, but doing it's going to require some changes. Doing that is going to mean that some investments have to be made. Um, it means that you know if somebody takes a gamble on producing those cars. Uh, they're going to have to invest a bunch of money and then there's no guarantee that their cars will sell better than everybody else's cars because how well things sell is based on marketing, not based on the quality of the product. Right? And so that's risky It won't, and nobody really wants to take that risk um, because uh, if you already have tons of money, um, you don't necessarily need to change. You can just keep making money the same way you're currently making money. And if you don't currently have tons of money, then you don't current, then you don't really have a lot of room to take huge risks. So in order to enact that policy, I have um, no profit motive really backing advocates of that policy change. I have people who want to do it potentially because may, in that changed environment, they think they're in a position to make money, but they don't have the money yet. And we have people who want to do it because they know it's the right thing to prevent all life on earth from um, being subject to horrible conditions that might only get worse forever. Right? Um, on the other side, you have an oil company and maybe you have people who don't want to have to make big changes to the way they do business, but let's just focus on the oil company. Let's imagine that a small policy change will cost my business $1 billion. Um, and that policy change might be enacted by the state of California where there are 120 legislators and one governor. So the question then in my mind is, does it cost me less than $1 billion to influence 121 people to make a decision that favors me? And if it costs me less than a billion dollars, it is um, profitable to spend as much money up to that level to try to influence those people in order to keep the favorable policy. In practice, it costs much, 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 much less. Um, and when you think about that profit motive, every dollar invested by polluting industries in order to prevent those policy changes has a massive return on investment. People sometimes complain that lobbyists are paid so much, but they are a bargain. If I pay, you know, I think that Chevron spent, I'm gonna get the number wrong. Let's call it 5 million or 10 million or so last year in California. Uh, you can look it up. I'm not sure what exactly is the number. Um, a single regulatory decision at the California Air Resources Board um, saves them $365 million. So if they spent $10 million just on that one decision, which they didn't, um, 
that was a small fraction of the of the you know efforts that they did to influence policy. Um, that had a you know hundred x return on investment. So that's why it's a fight, because while politicians um, often want to do the right thing, politicians often, in some cases, are not persuadable by um, profit-driven industry groups. Um, um, and the concerns that motivate activists often motivate politicians. People a lot of times go into politics because they're civic minded and they actually care about stuff. People want to do what their constituents want them to do. You know, that said, if I can hire 50 lobbyists who are going to knock on your door every day, 10 times a day, um, if I'm going to have the implicit or explicit threat that I will run a very costly electoral race against you if you don't vote my way, and then I do that a hundred times over. Um, a few of those times, you're just going to not be able to keep up the fight against that level of, um, let's call it pestering. Right? You get worn down. You hear from one side over and over and over and over and over again. And then the other side, you start to look for things that you can concede. And that, that's why it, that's why the fight theory of change is, is sort of what motivates me. Um, because that's the way decisions tend to get made in this context. Hi, I'd love to ask a question about coronavirus real quick. You kind of talked about how there was this momentum building of mm -hmm. um, climate and uh, this was like going to be the climate election. Um, and, and now that's changed a lot. And I'm wondering from your conversations with activists, other organizing folks mm -hmm. within the climate community, how are people addressing this? Because some climate organizations that I've talked to are literally like, we're not talking about climate. We're gonna only talk about coronavirus. Um, and, and we're gonna get out of, out of that altogether for now. And some of the organizations are kind of hesitantly going, going forward. What are you seeing? Um, mm -hmm. from folks who can be think is the best path there. Yeah, people are figuring this out still. Um, let me take a detour and get back to the answer to your question. Um, okay, uh, let me, this is going to be very boring, so I'll make it short, but I need to talk to you about the legislative calendar in California. Um, the legislature came back on January 6th. Everything sort of proceeded as normal until February 21st when the 120 legislators I mentioned before were kind of faced a deadline where any bill they're going to introduce, they have to introduce by that day. Uh, something like 2,000 bills were introduced. Of those, um, I flipped through them all and found um, maybe 200 that were in one way or another climate related. Um, of those, I sort of winnowed out maybe 50 and there were some really big things on that list things like a law to enact a um, standard for carbon, for California to achieve carbon neutrality. Um, uh, you'll hear about SV50 from another one of your speakers. There was a bill to enact um, regional standards for reducing vehicle miles traveled. There's a bill to deploy a million chargers throughout the state by a certain date. There's a bill to um, limit physically how far an oil well uh, or how close an oil well is allowed to get to a house or a playground, really big, hard things. Um, and there were a lot of them. Um, the legislature sort of closed. Uh, um, there's um, finished hearing essentially all of those bills in committee and then to vote on them um, in their house of origin by May 29th and send them over to the other house. Um, simultaneous with that, January 10th, the governor released a draft budget for the state, which included his plans for investment in um, clean energy, he proposed a $250 million, what would be called a climate catalyst fund that would fund things like um, 
I think someone mentioned catalytic hydrogen projects, um, getting those off the ground would be the type of thing that would be funded by the Catalyst Fund. Um, it was a $222 billion budget. Um, once the shelter in place orders came, um, California's everything changed. Um, we are required by the state constitution to enact a budget by June 15th. And so that budget is going to be basically how much does it cost to keep the lights on and to maintain like basic level state operations. Anything that's sort of a policy, like an expression of policy besides we still exist as a state will not be reflected in that June budget. Um, with the exception that we will spend some money on um, addressing the pandemic. Yeah, I need to switch to... Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. And somebody please say something so I can see if my dead AirPods changed anything here. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, you might hear my wife on the phone in the background, her mom. Um, okay, so we'll have the state budget that will reflect um, really just bare bones operations. Um, but that's in June, right? Now, chances are, um, let's say very optimistically, um, three weeks from today, we see the active infective infections uh, declining. Um, we, you know, never really approach the surge capacity in hospitals. Um, people are very antsy to get back to work and everyone is broke. Um, and the question is going to start coming up. Um, well, what are we, what are we going to do as an economy? So I think Carolyn, the, you know, the that background is um, also present in the at the federal level, but at the state level, it's different because um, we do not have the ability to print money at the state. The federal government can just decide another trillion dollars exists, um, which they should and they are at the moment. The state doesn't have that ability. If we want money as a state, we essentially are, you know, working like a small business or a household. We need to either uh, get it from other people, we need to sell stuff, we need to borrow it, right? Um, so we need, as a we need as a state to make big investments. Uh, we don't necessarily know where that money is going to come from. And at the same time, the fact of shelter in place um, and other factors in the coronavirus mean that all of our sources of money are dramatically smaller. Um, you know, there is less pollution because people are burning less stuff that pollutes. So as a consequence, they have less cause to buy money or to buy cap and trade allowances. So there's less money in the greenhouse gas reduction fund that is funded by people buying those cap and trade allowances. So the stuff that we like to invest in that is paid for out of the cap and trade money now has way less money available to invest. Um, same thing is true with sales taxes. People are just buying less stuff. The same thing is true with capital gains, which is a major source of revenue for California. Um, people don't really have capital gains right now because the stock market is down so much. And thanks to the probably worst law in California, Prop 13, uh, we don't really have any money from property taxes either because of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association's success in enacting that law in the 70s that has kneecapped the state's budgets ever since. Um, okay, so to the question then, what's that have to do with climate advocacy? Uh, climate advocates that are speaking sort of at the intersection of coronavirus and their climate-related advocacy goals are probably thinking about what happened in 2008. 
um, we had a massive recession and the federal government put together a couple of big spending packages and part of those spending packages um, included the investment and production tax credits for renewable energy, which uh, essentially created the conditions for renewable energy to finally take off after decades of opposition. There was a crisis, that crisis was uh, also an opportunity, that opportunity was seized, uh, and at least one sector of the economy is better off today because of it. A lot of folks are looking at the federal government right now the same way, but there's a really important difference, which is that Trump and Mitch McConnell actively oppose things that Democrats and pro-climate people want, even if they benefit business, even if they benefit um, districts that tend to vote Republican. It's ideological, um, and they're not persuaded by just the fact that it's a good idea, even for them financially, materially. For that reason, um, and also just out of a concern that uh, the crisis is so acute and so immediate right now around the um, just uh, impossible to contemplate horrors of, you know, people contracting this virus and dying from it, that a lot of advocates think, if I speak up, it is uh, potentially insensitive to that suffering to talk about anything about that suffering in, a most, in its most immediate and direct way, or it's strategically backwards because uh, maybe somebody can advocate for getting something good done, uh, but it shouldn't be me, because if I advocate for it, then it will just draw more opposition. A lot of groups are trying to navigate that. In California, we are not in that position. Um, Governor Newsom um, is really focused on the immediate crisis, but he, I think, is also focused on, or rather, he is also cognizant of the fact that the immediate crisis won't last forever, and that coming out of it, um, we're going to have the choice to come out of it in a smart way or a stupid way. So he doesn't have the same tools at his disposal as the federal government does, but there's an opportunity in California to um, say that um, once we get out of this immediate worst stage, we should be making decisions that keep the long view in mind, that make us more resilient against the next crisis, that reduce the size of the next crisis, that keep in mind that fire season is coming, COVID or not. Um, and that we have you know, really critical needs um, every year that are climate related. So I don't know, um, I don't know if that answers your question, Caroline, but I think it's, these are the types of things that I think people are weighing in this context. I think in practical terms for California, that means that Probably nobody is trying to get much of anything uh, into this June budget that's related to anything besides like emergency relief, right? So that could be some stuff around fire, which is sort of inherently climate related, but basically we're not going to see much policy there. That said, the session goes until August 31st. The veto deadline is September 30th. Both of those actually can be moved. Anything really up to November, thir November 30th, there's a little bit of flexibility on. So we'll probably see subsequent supplements to the budget. And that may be where we see most of the policy this year. Because of those, remember those 200 bills that I said related to climate? I'd be surprised if, you know, 10 of them get heard at this point. But maybe some of them will get done through executive action. Maybe some of them will get done uh, through the budget process. So I think that people are looking, just like we kind of always do, when one avenue is cut off, we look for other avenues. And then Megan, uh, I think you had a question, right? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so I was wondering, you mentioned that um, advocating or electing officials who are like pro-climate is like 
the best way to go about um, solving the climate crisis. But what about um, democratic candidates, the fact that democratic candidates even haven't done anything subs to substantially um, combat the climate crisis and kind of the system of electing elites is part of the structural underpinnings of the crisis. Um, do you have any insight into how we can combat that? I mean, nothing, nothing probably that other folks don't. Um, I think what you're seeing with, um, how do you say, what you've seen that's really driven ideological drift rightward on the right has been in Koch brothers that's willing to date and run that candidate as a threat. And what happens is when you run one primary of a more radical Republican against a less radical Republican, um, the 10 Republicans around that one say, oh shit, I don't want that to happen to me too, right? Um, arguably the same thing happened with on the left with the driven by people power rather than Coke money, but with the election of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, for example. So those primary campaigns of more progressive Democrats against um, less progressive Democrats, I think are, are a tool that's available and that people shouldn't be afraid to use. Um, you know, that said, um, people tend to govern on what they campaign on so if you have a um, if you have a Democrat that campaigns on climate, that creates an opportunity to stay engaged with that candidate after they win election, even if they are a you know even if they're sort of less inclined to take steps you know at the scale that science demands. They might not introduce that bill, but they may be a gettable vote for that bill. Um, and I think for um, ever, I guess, really, uh, very few candidates have run on climate because they can win without running on climate. And so the just really direct organizing pressure to force candidates to go on the record on issues like climate um, also gives you tools for holding them accountable when they're in office. So confronting them at public meetings, confronting candidates, um, um, asking them questions in interviews, writing up you know, assessments of what their platform looks like and whether it comports. All of these are actually pretty effective tools for helping to move people who are um, gettable, but maybe not prioritizing the issue right now. Dave, I'm wondering, um, speak to your kind of general thoughts on how Gavin Newsom has performed with respect to climate and um, w whether you see wh what you're looking for as in the next year or two um, as sort of to, to what, what policies and or budget priorities where you would say like, okay, this is um, progress, this is serious progress versus two more years went by and we, we didn't continue making progress in California? Yeah, this is another one of those questions that the answer that I would have given you, you know, two months ago might be different from the answer that I give you right now. Um, and I'm not sure if I know what the answer right now is, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer. Um, I think that Governor Newsom um, wants the state to do well on climate. He sees the targets that we have, like making a 40% emission reduction by 2030, as things that need to be achieved. Um, I think that he, you know, will tell you himself that he is not Jerry Brown and he's not making climate like a signature issue for himself in that way. But, you know, I think he also has a case to make 
that Jerry Brown set the table, um, set, you know, achievable but ambitious targets. And now it's his job to make these sort of practical changes in policy that, it, that enact those targets. Um, and, you know, different people will be more or less satisfied with that answer. So the way that I think that this governor thinks about achieving the climate targets, though, is to say, um, look at transportation emissions, uh, which are climbing still and are 40% of the emissions in the state. Um, how do we address that? One way to address that is to invest lots and lots of money in vehicle electrification. Um, I think he should do that. Um, I've advocated for him to invest, to focus more on that, um, and so have others. Uh, and so far, he has not, you know, made that like a core policy priority. Um, but, you know, he isn't, um, I don't want to, you know, overstate the, the, the lack of progress there. I think progress is being made, but it's not, you know, the idea of just spend a shit ton of money on vehicle electrification and charging infrastructure uh, is to me kind of the most straightforward way to address transportation emissions, but it has problems. Um, it doesn't address a lot of other problems. Um, his approach is to say, we also have a housing crisis. Housing, that housing crisis increases VMT. Um, in some cases, really extreme amounts. That's related to our poverty crisis. That's also related to our homelessness crisis. Let's address all four of these crises at the same time uh, through a systemic, systematic policy that you know I will call housing policy, but is really addressing four things together. Um, I think that that's how he's approaching most climate-related issues. Uh, you can see that a little bit reflected in his executive order they put out last fall that essentially says, I'm directing all state agencies to work together to integrate our climate targets into the, what they're doing. Um, that means things like the California Transportation Commission, which is essentially an agency for building freeways, um, has to actually finally say, uh, maybe building freeways like all the time in every single case um, isn't always the right answer. Maybe to the extent we're building freeways, we also need to be increasing the amount we're spending on active transportation and transit. Maybe, you know, we need to at least justify our decisions as not being against the climate target. And so there's these little changes of uh, saying something you weren't thinking about before, you have to think about now. Um, that you can see reflected uh, at the Natural Resources Agency, at Caltrans, um, at, well, especially those two have um, seen a lot of continuity in their mission and their priorities between the Brown administration and the Wilson administration. Um, there's a question about CalGen and the fracking permits. Um, I don't know how to how much to make of that. So CalGem is the agency that um, uh, regulates oil production in California. There was an executive order that the governor put out a few months ago that said we are suspending and reviewing all pending fracking permits. We're going to open a rulemaking to look at um, public safety and air quality around oil drilling sites. Um, and I think there was maybe one other provision in that executive order. Um, the, that opening of that rulemaking was something that advocates um, pushed Jerry Brown on for eight years um, with tremendous, tremendous resistance from the governor. Um, the order that Newsom put out to that effect uh, did not meet the full suite of demands of the advocates who are pushing on Governor Brown and then Governor Newsom on um, better regulating oil production. Um, but it shows that shift. It shows that from being dead set against doing anything, um, anything like that, like Jerry Brown was, to looking for a path forward on some of these sticky, you know, on the ground issues. The fact that 24 fracking permits were just issued 
Um, I think, but don't quote me on this while I'm here recording it. But the point is, I'm, I, I would not, I would not swear to this uh, interpretation. My guess is that the terms of that EO said that all the permits needed to be reviewed. Um, that review occurred for these permits and that essentially no further reason for holding them could be found um, within you know, the scope of existing law and that to deny them based on what they found in the review um, or to hold them you know, after the re review had been completed would potentially create legal liability or would be a show of bad faith or to show that the, you know, that the EO was uh, uh, in being interpreted more stringently than it's actually written or something like that. I, you know, I don't think that this governor wants to be issuing fracking permits uh, necessarily. I don't know that, but I don't know that not issuing them is such a high priority for him that he's willing to take that level of risk. Um, so that's, um, I mean, the fact that those things are on the table and then have been in the pipeline long enough to get to the point where they are issued now is a show that there's a need for changed policy. Um, but I, I would guess without having actual knowledge uh, that these are things that have been in the works for long enough that it was sort of not credible or possible to hold them up longer in, you know, according to their interpretation of the law. Um, going forward, though, you could say um, there are these new restrictions, there are these new conditions that have to be met, and maybe a permit like the ones that were just issued uh, couldn't be issued in the future because of the change in the law. You know, that said, in light of um, the global, you know, oil price war that's going on right now, um, California's oil industry is going to be among the hardest hit in the state, among the, among the hardest hit industries in the state. You can't produce oil in California for $20 a barrel. You can't produce it for $30 a barrel. Um, California oil is extraordinarily expensive and dirty. Uh, and the fact that it continues to be produced at all is merely a function of the fact that we have not reduced our demand for oil and that oil prices have been, you know, north of a certain benchmark for a while. Um, planning for a just and stable transition that protects the workers and the economy that are depend on, dependent on those industries, um, when those industries go bankrupt, is something that I and others have been pushing for forever, and that folks in power um, who are, you know, influenced mostly by oil companies don't want to deal with. Um, they don't want to plan for the day when oil stops being, you know, the backbone of Kern County's economy uh, because oil doesn't ever want to stop. And it will say, if we can't produce at a profit, we want a government bailout. You know, plan B is always to get more money from somewhere to keep making money. Um, and so the idea of coming up with a sort of smart, just transition plan is anathema to those industries. And I think, uh, and it's really sad to me and to a lot of people who, you know, um, who come from places not so different from Kern County, uh, that essentially they are walking off of a cliff into this economic destruction that they're facing now when their oil industry is going to be just absolutely decimated by $20 per barrel prices. David, um, I'd like to back up just a second. Uh, your comment about uh, Newsom wanting to take an integrated approach to land use planning, housing affordability, homelessness, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> has, have there been any discussions in terms of enforcement of SB 375? Uh, yeah, but SB 375, this is a bill that creates sustainable community strategies that requires, you know, regions to um, uh, to plan smartly, uh, was enacted without any enforcement provision. Um, there's no leverage there. So one of the things potentially on the table this year was um, 
taking another crack at SB 375 that um, Van Allen had proposed a bill to establish regional DMT reduction targets. Um, you know, I'd be surprised if a big ambitious bill like that goes forward in this context, but it's certainly, I think, on people's mind. Uh, you know, in the meantime, though, just yesterday, day before, um, Caltrans issued a new memo saying we're finally implementing, uh, there's a complementary bill to SB 375 that said the way we interpret uh, CEQA, environmental review law in California, um, is to treat vehicle miles traveled as an environmental impact. Um, and Caltrans now finally seven years later is going to say, in evaluating this highway project, we have to consider whether it's inducing additional vehicles mile, vehicle miles traveled. And if it is, they have to be mitigated or the project has to be redone so that it doesn't induce that as VMT. So we're starting to see little tweaks like that that look like SB 375 enforcement, even though they might not be literally SB 375 enforcement. You know, to the question somebody asked before about, you know, the level of change that we need. Yeah, these are tweaks. Like, this is not a yeah. radical reforming of the economy. Um, um, that radical reforming of the economy, I think, if it happens, um, our best shot at it is in the decisions we make coming out of the current recession and COVID crisis. Uh, the success that California has had so far on reducing its emissions back to 1990 levels has been almost 100% a function of cutting um, pollution from the power sector. Th those pollution cuts from the power sector have come in very large part as a result of decisions and investments made coming out of the 2008 recession. Um, that's the that's the dynamic that got us, you know, as far as we've gotten, and we need to reproduce it at much um, larger and more urgent scale in the midst of this much larger and more urgent crisis. So that's, you know, I think what's on my mind and what I think should be on every climate advocate's mind is um, in the America that emerges from the COVID crisis. Um, how are we going to make some fundamental structural changes that reflect where we need to end up uh, so that you know, 10 years from now, we can uh, point to a decision that was made in 2020 or 2021 and say that you know, this is why um, electric vehicles are the norm now or whatever, whatever that you know, technological change that you're interested in is. Uh, I was wondering if you could go into a little more depth about how you view this crisis for oil, for American-based oil companies, because I'm trying to wrap my head around the, the, the ramifications of it, because in some sense, it's sort of a parallel to like the ultimate death spiral of, of demand shock with oil companies. Um, and sort of like when people talk about the uh, the carbon bubble bursting when we finally, you know, investors don't view uh, oil majors as as worthwhile investments, you know that that's not going to be because we run out of oil. It's because we we get off of it. And so how it so there's sort of like some similarities to that in this current acute demand shock. But then obviously the demand is going to go back up. And how do you view that and what are the opportunities for leverage um yeah well so yeah so right now there's a massive demand destruction for everything including oil right um at a certain point though will i be able to keep telecommuting i mean i'm not a great example because i bike to work but will other people um will people who currently drive to work five days a week start only having to drive to work two days a week. Um, little changes like that um, may make a big difference. And then, 
let's say that telecommuting is kind of the, um, the knife's edge, right? Then people are using their car a little bit less and then the car feels a little bit less essential to who they are as a person. And then the idea of, of um, wanting to be able to walk safely becomes more salient and more important. Maybe the fact of um, reconnecting with being outdoors uh, or being at home a lot has, has changed people's perspective. There, there are little snowball things like that that may occur. And if in that window, we say, um, traffic's down, maybe this is a good time for us to remove some driving lanes and replace, um, or some parking lanes and replace them uh, with parklets and EV charging. Uh, maybe we can replace driving lanes with bike lanes, right? Um, if you're able to make changes like that in long-lived infrastructure during this transitional period, what is a temporary change now um, doesn't need to rebound 100 or 110 percent. Maybe it only rebounds, you know, 30, 40 percent. Um, and I think that's where the opportunity is. That opportunity, by the way, is primarily at the city and county level. So talk to your city council. All right, I think we are over time. Um, yep. Um, any last last words of wisdom for or uh, call to action for uh, for any anyone uh, in this call? Or I mean. What would you what would, what would your closing argument be, D Dave? For oh, uh, sorry, I thought that was a, that was for well. I, either I, way, <laughs> yeah. No, I um I, I think I just gave it. Um, so I've I've talked a lot. Um, let's see. Thanks for all for making time to do this in the evening. I know um uh there's a lot going on, so I appreciate you coming out, and and it's it's really good to. Um, it's good to see you all, and it's great to know that you're all working on a lot of really important and interesting things. I, when you were going through at the beginning, talking about all the stuff that you're studying, I kind of wanted to skip the presentation and just ask all of you about the things that you're building. Um, and it sounds super interesting. So uh, keep it up um, and stay in touch. And you know, don't ignore policy in your work. Policy is going to determine whether the thing that you figure out uh, actually gets out into the world or not.